Hello and welcome to episode six of Cricket Scorers Untallied. My name, as always, is Julia Farman, and with me today is the ever lovely Sue Drinkwater. Hello, Jules and Brian. <laughs> and a nice little quick introduction there. We also have Brian Rodwell with us as well. Hello. So it's been quite the week in recreational cricket in England and Wales this week as the ECB have announced plans for returning back to recreational cricket with their roadmap, looking a little bit like the current UK government steps of uh, trying to ease lockdown restrictions. There are lots of discussions and information points about how we can fingers crossed, get some recreational cricket uh, back into England and Wales. Um, For listeners outside of the UK, just to note that Cricket Scotland will have their own setup and likewise, we sometimes get linked in with Ireland, Ireland will have their own sort of setup as well. So it'll be interesting to hear from, if you are listening from outside the UK, what measures or guidelines that have been put in sort of overseas but likewise if you've also got back to playing recreational cricket and what conditions you are working with but we're just going to have a bit of a discussion now about uh, the current guidelines from the ECB that have been issued out and what's going to happen so Sue I think you've got some intel on cricket leagues starting to work out the game formats. Well yes I've heard a little bit mainly on social media um, but a little bit about some some cricket boards being proactive because uh, the ECB have issued a five-step um, guidance for return to cricket, and we're currently in step three, which is where you can do some group training. You can go to the nets, and um, in groups of six, I believe, you can you can do some training. Um, but the move, hopefully, very soon, we'll go to step four, which they're calling adapted gameplay, um, and they're suggesting that you can play some shorter formats uh, of cricket outdoors. Um, so I think some leagues have already been proactive, try, or not some leagues, sorry, some county boards, trying to organise some tournaments and some competitions for people to play in. Um, and I think down in, in um, the south of England, they are looking to play eight-a-side cricket so that you can space the fielders out more uh, and that there are fewer people um, at the ground and I've also seen on social media some counties are considering um, a T10 format which has been quite popular Uh, we've seen the T10 cricket recently played in Vanuatu and in the West Indies and there's been um there's been a a T10 series uh, overseas some somewhere like is it Abu Dhabi, somewhere like that, I, played I by so. English teams um, Yeah, in, in recent years? So I think the T10 format is, is coming quite popular. To me, it, cricket just seems to be getting ever shorter and shorter. But right now, if, if that means you can get some cricket being played, then I guess that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of attention is being paid to how to get teams back together which is the first thing you've got to organize the the competitions and get the teams organized and I know that some advice has been given to umpires that maybe they should be turning up ready changed so that they don't need to go indoors they don't need to use the changing rooms and also that they should bring their own food they shouldn't expect to get a, a tea there uh, players alike that there will be no teas provided as as such but I haven't yet heard of any guidance for scorers. Um, and scorers normally sit in in um, small spaces uh, and, and people crowd often around a scorer in a recreational format. They come up to find out how many runs they've scored, uh, any milestone information, um, and scorers get left looking after an amazing amount of things that, that aren't related to scoring. And I just wonder how they're going to feel about doing that now in a game. Yeah, that could be quite interesting of how they manage that and also manage where where we are and what facilities we have as scorers. You know, scoreboard controls, for example. Yeah. You know, are we are we going to be expected to look after those? Um and as we as we've discussed before, never the, the cleanest of places, uh, score boxes. So it might be a bit of an afterthought for scores, unfortunately. 
just sort of thinking actually a bit more on this, would it be the case that because they think the virus is less infectious out in the open air, would it not be the case that rather than scoring inside a hut or a room, mm-hmm. you'll actually be outside on a table scoring because that might be less riskier, but that brings other things to sort of manage, such as the elements, <laughs> which could be quite fun. <laughs> you can guarantee the, 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 the rain will come back as soon as the cricket season starts again. And we've all we've all scored outside scoring with a holding umbrella. We've all done that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's really tricky when the wicket falls, though. <laughs> it is. It's very much so. Yes. And I was thinking about um, m- my method of scoring if if in a return to cricket because if I'm using m- my own laptop, which I would probably be doing um, in an ideal situation uh, to score electronically. Would I want people coming up and breathing or coughing all over it to see what the score is? But there again, if I were to be scoring electronically, if I've got Wi-Fi, then maybe I could be posting the score on a live score site somewhere and people wouldn't need to come anywhere near me to see what the score is. Um, and, and yes, scoring maybe on paper might be safer because I think I think paper in, is considered to be quite... a a safe medium at the moment Um, but then would I want to use a communal score book or would I prefer to take my own score sheets then and and hand them in but um, Jules I think you said something uh, another time about um, people always borrowing the scorers pens so if I'm scoring on paper does that mean people are going to come up to borrow my pen uh, and borrow everything else I don't know it's it's really tricky I think for scorers yeah and I, the other thing as well I was talking about scoreboards but actually if you've got a really sort of old-fashioned scoreboard which is either the pulley levers or the flip numbers you know yeah. people are going to be touching that and so that mean yeah. that afterwards you're going to have to get the old antibacterial wipes all over the scoreboard which could yeah. be quite an effort in itself And should you just then have one person doing it, one person responsible for touching that during the match? Uh, Does it make sense to have the home scorer scoring the home matches if they've got one? If they've got one, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I think it may do. Mm. Uh, I think that actually a return to cricket for scorers is not a straightforward thing. It's not simple. Yeah, it's not not a table out in the boundary and hope for the best is it <laughs> no but it would be interesting to to hear um as you said earlier about what's going on in other countries how have how have other countries returned to cricket so there are some playing i believe jules did you know of somewhere else that, that they were playing at the moment yeah i've been speaking to a friend out in poland and they played on thursday and I have to say, I mean, I don't think the virus has been as bad in Poland as it has been, for example, in the UK. But um, there, I have to say, she was on her own and she had the electronic scoreboard set up in front of her. She had her um, play cricket scorer. She had her linear sheet and all her pens and everything sort of set out. But it was quite... A, it's quite interesting to see that there were players around, but not right next to her, if that made sense, from the, yeah. um, the shots that she sort of sent over. So, you know, that's the other thing as well. Players will naturally come up to you wanting to know their, their stats yeah. um, at the end of the match. So it could be a case, especially, say, for example, if you're a um, paper scorer, I'm thinking now that actually I'll probably just um, take a picture on WhatsApp and send it over to the captain so he can share out the information and do it like that but obviously Mm. with with the computer scoring if you can do live tweets and stuff that might help navigate that aspect but you know it's assuming people on whatsapp or on twitter to be able to access that information so it's going to be quite going to be quite an interesting old time be really helpful if there was sort of information out there yeah, yeah we definitely need some guidance coming out i think for for how is the best way to to for recreational scorers to get back to it. Yeah, absolutely. So, moving on from that, uh, we were actually reminiscing, as I think a lot of other scorers have been doing during this period, of uh, 
sort of more cricket happier times when there are lots of games being played. And actually sort of the birth and the formation of this podcast actually arose last year when we were, um, to be fair, we were discussing it initially at a very rainy um, first day of an Ashes test at Lords, but it then subsequently came into more fruition during the final of the Women's Super League um, game competition last year over at Hove, where Sue and Brian were there and Sue was scoring for the mighty Western Storm, who went on to win it. But uh, I understand, Sue, that you've also caught up with some of the other scorers from that day. Yes, um, I managed to uh, interview Kevin Gerrard, uh, who was there scoring for Loughborough Lightning, um, and Kevin Hutchinson, who um, wasn't there that day, but he's been scoring for Yorkshire Diamonds. Um, sadly, they weren't there on finals day. Um, but yeah, it was great that day. I, re- I remember uh, the sun shone and we managed to sit and watch the first game. Uh, it was It made a change, actually, to sit and watch cricket without actually scoring it. Likewise, it was, lovely. <laughs> it was a lovely day. It was, yeah. <laughs> and, and great memories of Western Storm winning the last ever Kia Super League final. Great day. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now we'll have a listen, shall we, to uh, Kevin Gerrard and, and Kevin Hutchinson talking about the Kia Super League and also um, Heather Vernon talking about scoring for uh, county women's cricket. So I'd like to welcome to Cricket Scorers Untallied today two men who are scoring in the women's game in the Kia Super League. First of all, we have Kevin Hutchinson. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Sue. And another Kevin, we have Kevin Gerrard. Hello, Sue. Hello. Um, So starting with you, Kev Gerrard, um, who have you been scoring for in the Kia Super League um, and elsewhere as well? Um, in the Kia Super League, I scored for Loughborough Lightning. I did all the four seasons with those. Um, in addition to Loughborough Lightning, I have scored or am scoring for Loughborough MCCU, the university side, one of the six centres of excellence. Um, and also, because we are based at the ECB in Loughborough, I'm lucky enough to quite often get asked to score different forms of um, EDP matches, which are development programme matches, both uh, male and female of various age groups. Um, because of that commitment, uh, there's quite a lot of scoring to do throughout the season. I had to stop doing my club cricket, which was at the time Loughborough Town. So since 04, I've done Loughborough MCCU and England development matches. And obviously since Keir Super League, the four seasons that was there, I did those as well. Oh, that's good. Kevin Hutchinson, how about you? I scored three seasons for the Yorkshire Diamonds. My club side on a Saturday is York in the Yorkshire Premier League. And I should have been making my debut for the Leeds Bradford MCCU side this season, but that's on hold. So how did you get involved in scoring for the Yorkshire Diamonds? The first year was done by a colleague of mine, a scorer colleague of mine called Kevin Motley, Um, Unfortunately, due to his health, he wasn't going to be able to do the second season. And somebody mentioned to me that he wouldn't be doing it. And I thought, well, it's something I might be able to do. And a a couple of conversations later, I spoke to Jane Hildreth, the the Diamonds manager, and declared my interest. And she was very keen to have me on board. And that, as they say, is, is where it all began. Yeah, you grasped the opportunity when it came your way. That's a, that's a really that's good right. thing. How about you, Kev? How did you manage to score for the, the women at Loughborough? When the um, Kia Super League was first muted, I think the first season was 2016, it was probably muted at the back end of the previous season about the Kia Super League starting. Um, Sally Ann Briggs, so I don't know many people have heard of, but um, she was the coach at uh, Loughborough men's side and then she took on the uh, Loughborough Lightning side when it, it started. Uh, I've known Sally Ann for many, many years and uh, she just asked me if I would be interested in scoring for the Loughborough Lightning side. So I just, it was uh, about a millisecond <laughs> thinking about it and said that was it. Um, right place at the right time, I suppose. That's great. Now, you've mentioned scoring um, at Loughborough. So is that at Loughborough University? It is, yes, at the Centre of Excellence, ECB. 
uh, on the university campus. Um, everyone goes out, basically, uh, training-wise, all the England team go there for fitness testing, training, both men and female. Um, it's still used by club sites. They can hire the facilities out. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's it's quite a good place to be, to be honest, to get involved. <laughs> It sounds like it. So generally, what sort of grounds um, did you, the girls play on for the Kia Super League? I've been very, very fortunate in that it's given me the opportunity to, to score at some very, very prestigious venues. My, my first game for the Diamonds was an evening game against Lancashire at Headingley. It's also taken me to... It's going to sound like I name drop, but the Oval, the Aegeus Bowl, Taunton, you know, so, some fantastic, some fantastic venues. But then also some of the good, some very good club grounds. So I've been Arundel. Um, we played a couple at my old, my own club, which is York, um, and Scarborough, which for a lot of people is is almost the nineteenth county ground, as it were. It's lovely at Scarborough, it is. How about you, Kev? What sort of places have you been to? Similar to what uh, Kevin has, really. I, I'm uh, lucky enough to have been to a lot of the county grounds anyway through the university side when we played the first class matches pre-season. You mentioned Arundel, Kev, and Scarborough. I've never done those two grounds, but I'd love to have done those two grounds. Um, I, I feel lucky because I'm not a, a county scorer, so, um, but I feel like... I've been privileged and lucky enough to go to a lot of the grounds. There's not, in fact, there's not many first-class grounds I'm not scored on, to be honest. Mm, that is good. With the girls, the Kia Super League, we travel as a team on a coach. Um, so you feel, to be honest, probably in a way, you feel probably more part of that team because you're with them from when when you meet on the coach. You go to the same hotels, you you probably eat at the same time. Um, with the girls pre-match meetings um i get i even get invited to pre-match meetings which you won't do necessarily with the lads um you feel more part of a team with with the girls that's not being um disrespectful to the lads because we tend to travel separately with the lads the only time i would travel with anyone to an mccu match is when graham dilly was alive and he was the coach at mccu me and graham dilly always used to travel together yeah, I, I would agree with you there, Kevin. For me, coming from an amateur cricket, a totally amateur cricket background, into what is a, a very professional setup, it was a great experience. Part of the experience was being able to travel around the country with the players, being made to feel properly part of the team because you, you you're on the coach eight to ten hours, you're you're eating together. You're hoteling together. Setting aside the actual cricket scoring side of it, that was one of the experiences that will always stay with me was belonging to that to that professional outfit. Now, you've talked about apart from scoring the game itself. So are there any differences scoring a, a women's game uh, to a men's game? I, I would say no, there isn't, because really a, a dot is, is still a dot, mm. you know, and... And as as you move through different varieties of cricket, your your skills that you have are are instantly transferable from one from one game to another because you are going in there to a to a great degree to, to do the same job. I, I would get the message across that take those opportunities that are out there. Don't don't be daunted to do that because. You are going to be using the same abilities. I use the same. I use the linear sheet and I use the PCS Pro. I, I use that for my club cricket. I use that in the Super League. It's I'm comfortable with it. If you're comfortable with what you're using, there is no difference in the actual scoring at, at whatever level, be it men's or be it women's, be it the Kia Super League at the Oval be it a club game at York, that the skills are transferable. Uh, yeah, I was. I would agree with what you say, Kevin. Um, a dot's a dot, isn't it? Whether it's uh, been, or a six is a six, whether it's been hit by a girl or a bloke. Uh, the only thing um, probably 
and maybe Kevin's probably Kevin's got more of this than what I have because even on the MCCU side, the men's cricket side, I do. He's still got an, an analyst there, uh, certainly with Loughborough anyway, uh, and obviously have with the girls. Um, so maybe at club level or what, what you do, Kevin, with your, you probably get the players coming up to you, asking you as a scorer for more information uh, than what you would do what I do uh, because they tend to go to the analysts with me. Uh, the only time they might come up to me is, oh, Again, this is probably more with the blokes and the girls, to be honest, is they're more int interested in what their strike rate is as opposed to how many runs they've got. Uh, so they'll come up to me because they can look at the strike rate a lot quicker than they can with the analyst. So I don't know if that, if you find that we're doing club cricket, Kev, uh, compared to what the girls used to do. I don't know. Yeah, that, that was one of the differences for me, I guess, with, with, the, with the Super League, is that... As a scorer, I found myself interacting with a lot more people. On a club day, on a Saturday, I just interact normally with my scorer colleague. Obviously, once this is the game's, game's going on. Whereas in, in the Super League, you are having contact, more contacted with the managers, the coaches, the analysts, when we were fortunate enough, we had about probably about half a dozen games in total where the cameras are there. And so you've got Sky that you have to interact with. And also, it's the first time I'd worked with anybody from Opta. Having more people in the box than, what, than I was used to was, was, again, a different experience for me. So you've mentioned... Um cameras and and lights um so do, were they there just for the women's game or do sometimes um the women's and the men's games play at the same time over the season i think we had about four back-to-back -back games where the girls went on first played their t20 match televised and then it was more or less immediately followed by the the men's t20 match in their in their competition um I remember doing one at Taunton. I did one at Old Trafford under floodlights. Uh, I'm sure if my memory serves me right, Kevin, I did one with you at Yorkshire. I think that was a back-to-back -back match as well, if I remember right. Um, yeah, I, th I think you're right. That was that was a game where I think we preceded the the game with Warwickshire, mm -hmm. and and that that as well was was a different experience because it it meant that. We didn't have the score box to ourselves for the entirety because you were you were aware that you were either going to be followed by some more score by a pair of scorers for the next game, or you were coming in while they were in in the middle of scoring their game. It, it was a case of just having to be a bit disciplined in in what you were doing before and after the games on those on those double header days i think also with that like you're right in what you're saying there you know you've got the your your fellow scorers for the second match coming in uh but in addition to that you you mentioned the opta guy he, most of the times he would be sitting in the same room as you uh there'll be um the scoreboard operator maybe um if you weren't doing it yourself um and so it weren't just the two of you. Very rarely was there just the two of you in the school box. There were probably at times there might have been five or six of you in there doing various things. I can remember once at Loughborough, I had uh, Henry Moran from Radio 5 doing commentary sat literally next to me. So it's quite, um, you need to be, you need to keep your focus when, when you're scoring in those kind of environments because you do have more distractions than, than you might normally be used to. So it's a case of just focusing on on your skills and what you're there to do um, and sort of letting everything else happen around you, as it were. You've got to have confidence in your own ability and confidence in your fellow scorer to know you're right and just do what you do normally. Forget, try and forget the TVs mm -hmm. there. Now, you're two men scoring in uh, women's cricket. Has that thrown up any issues? Have you had any problems there? I would say, for me personally, no. What what this what 
what the women's game, the Kia Super League gave me, was it gave me an opportunity that possibly is would be harder for me to get in the men's game simply through opportunity or availability of the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I, but what I do think is, I mean, we had in the Kia Super League, there, there was a mix. I think half the teams were scored by men, half the teams were scored by women. Um, and what it highlighted really was that it's cricket scoring gives an excellent opportunity to to give you a wide experience and i think it's important that we don't make we don't pigeonhole scorers into certain kinds of cricket because i think to do that it, it undervalues the role of the scorer really and some of the best scorers need to be in in the best environments whatever the gender alignment is on on that on that scoring and cricket I, I think the other thing that's worth worth remembering as well that while I was scoring in the Kia Super League, it was good to interact with with a couple of the actually the women were umpiring as well. Mm. So so it was good to, good that we got a mix of of women and men on if you like on both sides of the team of officials. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's just the, the way things are going. It's a good way things are going, I think, as well. You know, it's, you know, it goes without saying women's cricket has come, certainly in the last five years, has come on leaps and bounds. The ability of the players, the ability of the umpires, the officials, um, second to none. You can't fault it. And it'll only get better. I think it, it would be remiss of me not to to sort of pay tribute really to the to the professionalism of of everyone surrounding that competition and if if i can be self indulgent and pick a highlight out I, i'm going to do that and say for me um, young indian superstar jamima rodriguez a century for the diamonds but more importantly on my home ground at york w- would have been the highlight I'm sure Kev's got a highlight of his own, have you? Oh, I, I won't. I won't think it'd be fair for me to pick one particular highlight out. To be honest, um, Loughborough Lightning was lucky or fortunate enough. We were one of the probably the stronger teams. We never actually won it, but we got through to finals day three years out of four. Um, so I was lucky enough there to see that. Um, Kirsty Gordon won the or won or got the most wickets, I think, in 2018. I think um, I can remember Amy Jones having a couple of cracking innings. Um, I wouldn't like to pick one particular innings out. That would be fair, I don't think. Um, Kier Super League ran for four years, um, 2016 for first season, finished in 2019. I thought that had quite a short short shelf life i thought it could have been probably another two or three years it was excellent cricket the standard improved year on year uh, if you look at some of the matches in 2016 and look at some of the matches in 2019 i'm sure you would have seen a vast improvement in the standard of play by the girls uh, and where does it go from here i know the 100s should have started this season it's not it's obviously hopefully next season um, where do the girls cricket go from here? They can't just play 100 all the while. They've got to have the more lengthy format of cricket. Yes, go on, Kev. I think from a personal point of view, uh, I would love to have seen the, the Super League continue in, it, in its current format with me as the scorer for the Diamonds. Yeah. But, but I appreciate that of course. from a wider point of view, for both the, the women in the game, the, the move to the 100 with, with more teams has given more opportunities to, to more play, for more players to have a taste of that professional experience. Hopefully, it will give more opportunity to more scorers to have a taste of, of what I've been very fortunate to do over the last three years. I hope you're right. Okay. If we look at it purely from a 
scoring point of view, it, there is going to be more opportunities out there for scorer colleagues to to do more higher profile games. And and from my own experience, I, I would encourage anybody who gets the opportunity to do anything like that to embrace it. it, it you trust trust your own skills that you have and and just see how far they will take you i, I couldn't ever envisage that i would get to score at the oval um and i've done that now you know so if if you're out there as a young scorer or an experienced scorer take the chances that are available for you and and really enjoy it and savor it and make the most of it yeah. That's really good advice. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and thank you both uh, for talking to us today for Cricket Scorers and Tallied. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Sue. Thank you very much. It's time for drinks. And now we're back. Okay, so uh, in our women's cricket special for Cricket Scorers and Tallied, um, I'm speaking now to Heather Vernon who scores for Warwickshire Women. Um, so, Heather, could you tell me um, a little bit about scoring for a county women's team? Yeah, certainly, Sue. Um, I got involved in Warwickshire Women in a bit of a roundabout way, really, because um, I was scoring league cricket in Warwickshire um, and we were implementing uh, the electronic scoring. I was scrabbling around trying to find a training course and uh, linked up to one in Northampton, uh, which happened to be run as the tutor by Mel Smith. And oh, yes. Mel is the um, Warwickshire men's first 11 scorer. And he invited me to the score box one day at Warwickshire, which was a fantastic experience. It really sort of went from there. Mel, it, I think was asked, did, did they know of anybody who might be interested in scoring for the women? And my name came up um, and I was invited. So I've been doing it for about five years now. Um, and it's been a very varied experience. It's been really interesting. But when I first started out, we were playing uh, a mixture of 50 overs and T20s. So we had a 50 over one day um, Royal London Cup and a um, and then a T20 um, cup, which was made up of um, about well Division One, which Warwickshire were in, was made up of nine teams for the T20s, oh. and basically you played. There were three matches each day. Uh, you played on a Sunday, oh. um, and you each played. The three teams each played one another. So Warwickshire might travel. Um, to Yorkshire and play Yorkshire and Berkshire, for example. <laughs> I was doing ridiculous amounts of mileage, but great, great fun and meeting lots of people, seeing lots of d different grounds. The women um, would play their 50 over either home or away, but you only played the teams once. Um, you would play, uh, there were sort of eight, eight teams in the Division One. Um, eight in Division Two. Um, I think there were seven in Division Three A, and then six in Three B and Three C. And that's very similar to that in the um, T Twenty, but obviously slightly different numbers to make the matches. I think we have nine in, in Division One for the T Twenties. So you you would probably play out of those. Um, seven matches you would have maybe four home three away or vice versa uh, but it meant you only got one chance I found the the range of scorers as well was um, quite uh, quite different to league cricket so I, I might be scoring with somebody else that was on TCS or as it uh, we all I use scorer pro now obviously um, there would be somebody, some people might turn up and score on paper. Right. Some people turned up with a bit of paper and a pencil on one occasion. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to give them a sheet of paper. Wow. Um, it was a parent who'd just been roped in at the last minute. Um, Warwickshire were fortunate. We did have funding from the county club. Last year, we were really fortunate. We had 
uh, they actually appointed a director of women's and girls cricket but then of course with everything changing yeah. um, Laura has moved on I think she has got the the district uh, the, or the sort of the regional sorry the regional job um, but it was very varied um, I mean you would be sitting in a school box with um, so close probably that you were you were literally there's one at one of the public schools you were literally shoulder to shoulder absolutely I, I think it was designed for two 11 year olds <laughs> basically <laughs> and so once you've got two adults in there um you had to stand up and move your chair forward to shut the door um and then once you sat down you couldn't open the door um, <laughs> unless, you, unless you unless you both stood up <laughs> Oh, so it was, it was a real coordinated effort, you know, if you wanted to open the door to anything. Um, any and cups of tea had to be passed through the front, and it was a, it was a, you'll probably have come across these. It was a slightly sloped. Um, oh shelf. yes, yes. And <laughs> you could either, you could either have your book, providing yeah. it was fully open, or yeah. your laptop or your battle sheet, but you couldn't have two out of the three. So, um, and if you were trying to operate the scoreboard at the same time, which was, it was electronic, but you, if you were trying to operate that at the same time, you also had the controller for that to find the mm -hmm. space for as well. You're, normally they would play at what's called a foundation ground at Portland Road. Yeah, and I did that, the, the second yeah, eleven played there. Yes, they are playing. They have played some of their matches. Though the intention was they'd play a lot more this year because they've actually spent quite a bit of money on it. Um, I haven't seen the school box yet. I'm told that there is one. But when I first started, I sat in the um, dining area. So, um, and the, the when the sun was shining on the window, if you had to sit inside, because if it was a bit potentially damp or whatever, we would be in, sitting inside. And if the sun was shining directly onto me, the umpires couldn't see me see me signalling. And I, I did spend one match with my my phone, with the light on my phone, pressed <laughs> up against the window, waving madly, trying to signal. Um, I then progressed to a shed. Um, <laughs> progressed to a shed it was so it was it was progress it because i didn't have people milling around me going to the toilet or the, the things like that but the women did play uh, a head-to-head -head a couple of years ago with the men um what was really sad though was that the men played their match and then you gradually saw the stadium emptying as the women came on to play. Oh, no. That's probably one of the biggest changes I've seen over the five years is the standard of women's cricket. And what a fantastic um, flagship it's been for the England, you know, having the England women's team, getting the, more publicity and obviously winning uh, World Cup standard. You know, that sort of um, level of publicity has really brought the game on and, and I can see a big difference. Some of the girls in the early in the early years, and, and this is only going back, you know, five years. Um, some of the girls were paying to play. They some were of paying the, themselves. They were paying their expenses. They were paying a sub, you know, like you would if you, yeah. you know, you for a league match. Warwickshire have been extremely generous, and I have Good. been. Um, I've got have a mileage, and I've had um, a match a match fee. Good. Um, and a meal allowance when we've gone away. Mm. Um, last year, having um, Laura there as the director of women's and girls cricket made a big difference as well. Mm. My concern this year was that the girls would only be playing T20. Oh, really? um, so the expectation was we would have, um, I think it was probably going to be about half a dozen days of cricket at the T20 playing the other, um, you know, playing the same round robin with two other teams. Um, but after that, it was going to be much more regional based with the semi-professional teams. And I just, you know, could see the girls going, well, you know, what? how do we move? How do we yeah. move from one through to the other? 
quite a lot of them play for um, a, a, a club as well. Good. But again, they're, they're, they're not as widespread um, mm. as they could have been. Um, I was thinking back to my day because the girls that sort of, you, know, you get to know them and you get on, get, develop a rapport with them. And they would say, you know, did you ever play cricket? And I said, well, in my day, you had to be at a, a public school, you know, you know, to be going to, you know, a private school to, to play cricket. I said, the nearest I got was backstop at rounders. I said, so I... <laughs> so, <laughs> so they, they, they decided I was probably a, a thwarted wicketkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> For the first 11, the county women's first 11, where would those mm. results go? Would they be on the, the Warwickshire website? Is there a, a competition yeah. management system? Yeah, we use play cricket uh, in the women's game um, like you would in a league match. Um, it's a bit of an odd um, arrangement in some ways because although it's it's ca- county level, we, we're on play cricket in order to be able to arrange fixtures and and so on um the mat the matches and the results are on the county um in mm. fact last year um we were we had the live scoreboard up there which was good being able to produce the data has has been a, a big major step forward um, and i've produced statistics for the women's team each season um both from either play cricket or score a pro after the match i would send i send um all the bowling analysis the batting analysis um, there's about half a dozen reports i produce wagon wheels and individual stats for any girls that get over 50 you know i do produce a lot of statistics but obviously that's not available to a lot of the uh, of the clubs unless they've got scorers who are able to do that electronically yeah thank you very much uh excellent information very interesting okay well great to talk to you so and, and thanks very much for for all you're doing I don't like cricket. So it was really interesting there to get the different insights from both the county games that are being played with women's cricket um, in England, but also to understand a bit more the franchise uh, cricket aspect. And I think that would be quite pertinent, especially going into next year with the start of the 100 and the differences and how it all operates. So it'll be a case of seeing how it all develops as well. And no doubt if we're still going this time next year, which fingers crossed we will be for scorers around the world, we can start to discuss a bit more about how those 100 matches in franchise cricket is working in England or Wales. But it'll also be interesting to see if there are any scorers for franchise cricket in other countries, quite what their experiences are like too. But we can feature that in the podcast, I think, later down the line. Mm, That'll be good. Yeah, I think it will be. So... We do have our regular feature of Ask the Scorer. So last week we had Rory from Durban, South Africa, um, question about wides in partnerships. So Brian, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I have to confess that um, I use, I do count wides in the partnership. Um, I know some scorers have a feeling about whether wides should be included as balls faced. Um, but I, I do think that wise should be counted as partnership uh, just because they are runs that accrue during that partnership, even though the batsman hasn't had much to do with it. But I always take the the example of what would happen if a, a bowler bowled 50 consecutive wides. Would the partnership be off zero balls or 50 balls? It'd be a great, be one of those great quiz questions, wouldn't it? <laughs> thinking about it, you sit there and go, ooh. How did he? How did the partnership get to fifty and no legal balls were bowled? <laughs> Declaration bowling, or poor bowling. Well, actually, now I think about it, I saw, um, I saw somebody in a county game years ago, and they were taken off uh, having bowled three high pitch no balls that were hit for some runs and and because they they bowled three in a row they were then taken off and so they'd gone for something like 12 runs and having bowled no balls effectively yeah true because they had that they'd only bowled those three deliveries i remember it vividly now it was down at gloucestershire (laughs) 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 sitting in the crowd and watching it (laughs) 
I'd say it's quite an interesting one. So this is where I'm probably going to shock and horror for a few scorers. Ever since I started scoring, and I think it's because it's something that I've picked up from my dad, I've always counted wides as bull's face. Now, bearing in mind my dad's bit, and that's not just in partnerships, that's actually what the batter faces. And bearing in mind my dad was scoring probably like the 60s, it's a bit of a, a sort of an odd nuance to sort of take on board. But I've taken it on because... Um, that these days with the game and how it's played with sort of switch hits and the fact you see scoops and gosh knows what else in terms of cricket shots, a wide ball uh, conventionally is no longer really a wide ball because there's actually an opportunity for the batter to do something a little bit odd and funky to try and hit that ball. So is it technically ever going to be a wide ball? So I do sometimes get batters get a little bit chopsy and they tend to take the other scorer's um, book when they have the ball's face and things like that to make their figures look better. But the one thing I do pick up on in my scorebook, and I always put it in there, no matter, I think I do it every game now, is in the notes section or down the side is that I will count wides as balls faced by the batter. So at least then it's consistent across my books. So there can be sort of no ambiguity. And it's just something that I've always done. And on courses, we always teach scorers to, you can have your quirks, try and abide by the laws of cricket, but make sure you're consistent. So someone picking up your book in, say, 50 years' time can understand what's going on. Um, but I have to say, I do teach on courses the more commonly known way to not count wides as bull's face for the batter just because I think I might get told off by HQ but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't fancy being told sure, off but uh, I, do, I do always say if you look at my books um, you'll see that variation so it's a bit of a um, do as I say not as I do or sort of thing mm. <laughs> but <Yeah>. yes <laughs> well uh, I've always stuck to tradition and, and not included them as a as a ball faced by the batsman but I have included them in partnerships. But as with many of the questions that we've received recently, I think this comes back to statistics rather than scoring. And uh, we need to do things in a common manner so that statistics can be compared. Um, because it, as you're saying, Jules, if, if you're looking in one book at, and, and not the other, then you're going to get two sets of figures. You're going to get different strike rates. Uh, you're going to get things worked out differently. And it would be really good if somewhere there was a list of recommendations. Um, and I can think of two places uh, off the top of my head that that could come from. One is the Association of Cricket Statisticians, uh, who publish records, uh, cricketing records um, and cricketing statistics and Wisden because they they publish a lot of cricketing records and statistics and scorecards and it would be good to know how they do things so that we can do things consistently and if you looked at a scorecard, a cricket scorecard then to me it should be done the same at always and because then we'll we'll could compare gay we could compare statistics from different games um yeah so it's a difficult one to give a definitive answer on but i my gut feeling would be that you do include a wide in a partnership so i hope that answers your question rory but also a bit of a debate and discussion surrounding it as well and it'd be interesting to hear um, what other scorers do in terms of um, wide face, not just in partnerships, but batters as well, just because I want to build up a little crevice um, <laughs> that do for the individual batters. So I can say, oh, there's someone over in New Zealand that does the same thing. <laughs> for, for <that> too. <laughs> but maybe I'm just being very optimistic. So we have had another question this week, um, this time from Mike Turner. Um, and he's asked a very intriguing question on the basis that they'd taken over from another bowler halfway for an over, so three balls, and at the end of the innings bowled a partial over of four balls. So in neither case has completed a bowled over. So where you have a bowler coming in partway during the another bowler's over, for example, and the game finishes partway through the same bowler's um, 
over. How do you attribute the balls in total and how do you attribute the overs bowled in that match at the end of the innings when you do that bowler's analysis? I think we need some examples. Yeah. Do, you have, <laughs> do you have an example? But we think something like the one I've always been told would be like bold point four, you go off injured and then you come back later on in the day and you bowl another part over. So you bowl another point three and take the last wicket, for example. So then do you add them together um, and get, because uh, that's seven balls bowled. So yes, do you do you add those together and get 0. 0.7 or do you add them together and get 1.1 overs, I guess is the, is the yeah. dilemma. Um, yeah, and if hmm, I don't know, we'll have to ponder that one. Yeah, I think that deserves a whole pot of tea dedicated for thinking that one. <laughs> yeah, so it would be interesting to hear other people's opinions again. So, uh, yeah, if people could let us know what they think, we'll have a ponder on that and come back to it next week. I think. Okay, well that's it for this week of cricket scorers on Talid. Thank you very much for listening and downloading the podcast. We did reach a milestone um, during the week of having over 500 downloads. So we're trying to work out if we were to declare not to disrupt Brian Lara's famous 501 um, innings. But uh, we will be carrying on because it's been lovely to connect with scorers um, up and down and round the world. So it's been really good. And we'd love to hear from you more as well. So please do get in contact. Um, you can email us at cricketscorersuntallied at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at cricketscorers1 as well. And yeah, please do get in contact with us. So for this week, it's a goodbye from Brian. Goodbye. It's a goodbye from Sue. Goodbye. It's a goodbye from myself, Julia Farman. Been lovely to speak to you as always. Look after yourself, stay safe, and we'll be back with you next week.